just like the S&P 500, but for these different asset classes, some of those asset classes make 11, some make 12, some make 13. So then the question is, wouldn't I want to have some of those other asset classes? <laughs> this show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids & Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about optimal index fund investing strategies to help you realize a comfortable retirement or even an early retirement. To help us explore this topic in more depth, I've invited author Paul Merriman to the show today. Paul is an author of eight books, including We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. When he's not helping us learn smarter ways to invest, Paul enjoys spending time with family and friends in Oregon. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, Andy. It's great, great to be here. Well, let's jump right into this conversation about you know, smart ways to invest, especially index fund specific ways to invest. I know when um, people get started with their investing journey, they often look to their workplace 401k, which is a great place to start because you get that employer match. But then that inevitable question pops up of what do I invest in? Where do I start? And I know a lot of people start with target date funds. Can you talk to us about what a target date fund is? and maybe help people understand uh, how that breaks down. Well, Andy, I think the target date fund is the, the greatest investment product ever developed for, I want to call it the average investor. And that average investor in my mind would probably be 99% of the people who are investing. But what it does that no other fund did before it was it takes on the responsibility of recognizing your age and how much risk you should be taking when you're younger. And as you age, it makes all of the decisions for you so that when you're in your 20s, we would want to be virtually all in equities if we could. In your 30s, I would feel the same way. But by the time we get into the 40s and 50s, lots of people think we should start to cool our jets a little bit add some bonds to the portfolio. They do all of that. They do the rebalancing. They decide. And by the way, they are going to decide for you not to be a market timer. They are going to decide for you not to panic and go to cash because it feels like the, the world is becoming uh, unscrewed. What it, what, whatever that thing is that might get in your way, they take care of it. And And, and by the way, Andy, that's really very similar to what a pension fund used to be like. We would go to work. Money was put aside for us. It was our money, but we didn't have a chance to decide where it went. Pension trustees decided they need to have this money later in life. Let's do the right thing when they're young, when they're middle, when they're old. Target date fund does that all for you. And if you think about that, that means one fund. For the rest of your life, and I mean until the day you die, they will take care professionally at a very low cost, uh, your investments. So I am a huge, huge fan. Oh, and one more thing that just takes it over the top. Wharton did a study of 1.2 million 401k plans, uh, investors at, uh, at Vanguard. And what they found is the people who didn't use any target date funds and did it on their own, made their own decisions, what to be in, when to be in, and all of that. That versus the target date fund people, the people who were all in target date funds, there was a 2.3% difference in return to the advantage wow. of the target date fund holder. That doesn't surprise me because... Every study we've seen shows that if you let people do it themselves, so many of them, not all of them, but so many of them will respond uh, just the way just the way that people expect. And they do the wrong thing. The target date fund is guaranteed. Doesn't, by the way, mean you guarantee the return, but guaranteed to do the right thing based on everything we know about the past. Yeah, especially the keeping you in the market part. You know, we've had a lot of crazy events over the past 20 years, even the last five years that have rattled a lot of people and yeah. having that stability or that 
I guess, forced connection to the market uh, can be a really great thing. Now, we talked about a lot of the pros of target date funds. Are there any cons in your eyes? Well, there are, uh, but it, it, it's not so much a con as the realization that it's built to go up the mountain at the, at the slowest hiker's speed. So <laughs> it's, it's, they're conservative. And because they're conservative, like, for example, at Vanguard, they have 10% in the portfolio in bonds when you're a 20-year-old. That's wrong. We don't want any bonds in the portfolio when you're a 20-year-old. As a matter of fact, when the market's going down and you're a 20- or 30-year-old, you want to have all your money going into equities at lower prices. That's to your advantage, not to be in bonds. And by the way, a 10% position in bonds is not going to protect you from any big market decline. So that's one area where there's a weakness. Some, like BlackRock, have eliminated the bonds in those early years. So it's not one size fits all from every provider of these things. They build them with their own view of what's in the best interest uh, of, of the investor. The other thing that is uh, an extreme weakness based on the last almost 100 years of uh, investing evidence is they have very little value in the portfolio and very little small cap value. And uh, that's a big part of the educational process I'm committed to, is to make sure that people understand there's a legitimate reason why they don't have it in there, but there's a legitimate reason why you should have it in that uh, in your portfolio. So we've helped people broaden their exposure, uh, but that target date fund is the base. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that two fund portfolio that you've talked about in the past, how it takes the power of what's going on with a target date fund but then gives it a little boost so we can get to that uh, goal line or that uh, retirement date uh, sooner or in, in more comfort. Talk to us about the two fund portfolio. Well, it's the work of, uh, of Chris Pedersen, who joined our organization, another retiree, uh, in 2016. And uh, one of the things that he noticed was the things I was recommending were way too complex. And uh, Chris wanted to simplify things. And so he came up with this idea of combining a target date fund with some amount of small cap value. It could be a very small amount. It could be a, a, a actually it could be half of your portfolio. It kind of depends how old you are, how much risk tolerance you have. But that addition of that small cap value can add a half a percent a year to your return. So it becomes a big deal. Now, the good news is there's almost a hundred years worth of evidence that shows that this is in your best interest to do this. The bad news is you can't buy the past. And so yeah. <laughs> you are, as we do with all investing, it's a faith-based industry. None of us can know what is going to happen, but at least based on the past, just that a small, even 10% is worth doing. And like you say, Andy, uh, every extra half a percent, that's going to help you get where you're going sooner. And then when you get there, you're going to have more than others who didn't do this. At least that's, that's the view that I have. And and uh, and so it's a smart thing to do. And fortunately, there's a there are a couple of free books that teach you how to do that. So uh, my hope is we can talk a bit about that at some point. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm thinking effort right now. So with the target date fund, like mm. almost zero effort. You know, like you, you yeah. buy it and you're and you're and you go all the way until you're in retirement and beyond, right? Um, so with two fund portfolio, there's a little bit of effort. Talk about the effort that you might need to do to make that come to reality. Well, if you have the good fortune to have a small cap value fund within your 401k, it's simple. I mean, you put nine cents 
in, in, into the target date fund and one cent into the into small cap value. That is simple to do. And it's you can automate that and, and automate it in essence for life. The other uh, approach a lot of people end up taking is they do their target date fund and they don't have a small cap value fund in their 401k. And so they go to a hopefully a Roth IRA to take that position. It means means a little work, but we got to remember the payoff. And one of the things when I teach university students about investing, I don't start by introducing them to mutual funds and the stock market. I start by showing them the math of the difference of a return over a lifetime at 8% and 8.5 during the accumulation and 6% and 6.5 during the distribution. And even for a modest saver, that extra half a percent, if we can help investors find it, is worth probably somewhere between a million and two million dollars, even to a modest saver. So so that's that's the payoff. That's the advantage. And and it's just like the advantage to find the right index fund instead of actively managed fund. Okay, it takes some effort. Or you have to find somebody you trust and do what they say to do. But the payoff for the active versus the passive is not a half a percent. It's probably 1% a year. Now we're talking about the possibility of adding 1%, maybe 1.5% to our return over a lifetime. That's the math I want young people to understand. Then the question is, how do you get those extra half a percent to get you to earlier retirement or get you to be in a position like my wife and I are. We're able to lead a good life and we're able to give money to others to help them have a, a better life. And and that's a that's a huge reward for having been a good saver. Absolutely. And giving your time to educate others on an important topic yeah. like this. Now, we, you talk about index funds. And uh, if you if you go online, Paul, you might see the simple advice of just buying an S&P 500 index fund and riding that for a long time. What what about that as a strategy? Maybe pros and cons with, with that situation? Well, I think that's a great idea, by the way. The S&P 500, excuse me, we have evidence going back to 1926. By the way, there was no S&P 500 in 1926, but the academic community has created. How would you have done if somebody had put that 500 companies together? And by the way, it's not the same 500 companies because over the years, many of those companies that were great in the 20s and the 30s virtually disappeared and so it's 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 a it's an index that is created based on what we know about the past and again we have this problem you can't buy the past but what do we know we know that for long periods of time the compound rate of return of that very high quality index it's the highest quality has been about 10% and that's great because you can double your money about every seven years when you are able to achieve a 10% compound rate of return. Now, if you looked at other asset classes that are also have been studied by the academics and also built indexes, just like the S&P 500, but for these different asset classes, some of those asset classes make 11, some make 12, some make 13. So then the question is, well, well, wouldn't I want to have some of those other asset classes? <laughs> but the reason the S&P 500 makes people feel so secure is people know at least the big, the, the biggest companies in the S&P 500 are, are, are there. So there's a sense of trust. It's just like most Americans want to invest in U.S. securities because we know the system and we have a sense of trust. Well, for what it's worth, the people in Greece have an affinity to the Greek companies. So, uh, and so it's this is not uncommon that that we are uh, focused on the country, the market that we that we come from, and it's okay. But I know this: 
I know that if you're able to, to have some of those other asset classes in your portfolio, historically, that return goes up anywhere from 1% to 2% and even more. And, and if I could help a young person uh, in the equity part of their portfolio make an extra 1% to 2%, and then I would be able to also say, and actually not take more risk. I mean, this is the part that is so amazing, is, is that as you add these other equity asset classes, that it does not increase the risk uh, by any meaningful measurable amount. And you can say, well, how could that possibly be? Well, think about the S&P 500. The reason we feel comfortable with it is because there's 500 companies, not one, and some of them are going to fail. We know that from from the past. So diversification makes sense. And the academics teach us that diversification amongst different equity asset classes is actually more impactful and more meaningful than whether you have 100 or 200 or 300 large cap growth companies. So it's all there for the taking. And what's new about it, Andy, is is what we've discovered over the last 60 years. I have been, I am 80. I have been around this industry since the mid-60s. When I was a first-time investor and came into the industry, there were no no load mutual funds, or there were a couple, but people paid eight and a half percent load to get in. Everybody believed in active management because there was no such thing as an index fund. We didn't have ETFs. We didn't have target date funds. We didn't have low cost funds like we have today. In fact, Andy, investing has never been more efficient, never been as client centric as it is today. That's the good news. And I'll end with the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is there are a lot of really evil people who are trying to get you to do something with your money that is not in your best interest, and they are masterful at getting to us. So you and I, we're trying to educate people so they build a wall to protect themselves from those bad per- bad people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've experienced a lot of that. I, I experienced some of that in the beginning of my investing journey, not knowing much at all and putting a lot of money in the hands of someone who was more concerned about the commission they were going to get than the than the direction I needed to go in my late 20s for my portfolio. But and that's that, human that's, nature. That's a shame. It is human nature. And we, and we have to realize that, right, Paul? And we have and, to realize yes. the motivation. And they knew how to motivate you to say the right things. They actually take a try. I went through the training. I was a stockbroker for uh, a little yeah. over two years back in the 60s. Yeah. And you are you are trained to ask the right questions, to 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 get people to respond with yes. And the final yes is the, the, the ask for the order. And, and it's not that it's evil because it's part of the process. But what's important here is never has education about investing been more important because you know, pensions are not going to be a way for people to have money. Social Security may not give us what we're going to need. And so we're on our own in a way. Let's make sure that we're acting in our own best interest. I love it. Yes, I am a, a son of someone who has the pension. Very jealous of what he's got, <laughs> but I'm very, very happy for him. Good of for course. You. But I need to make my own pension. So let's talk about how we can modify this uh, portfolio and talk about your four fund portfolio. This is getting slightly more complicated, but again, not too complicated uh, for people who are going down this path of DIY investing and realizing that. This can be done well through index fund investing and automation. So talk to us about four funds. So so let me talk about a two fund and a four fund strategy, a little sure. different two fund strategy than the target date fund. Let's just look at investing in individual ETFs, exchange traded funds or mutual funds. The two ways you can do it and get almost the same long-term return, uh, go back to that 10% return from the S&P 500. 
you could actually build a portfolio that combines the S&P 500 and small cap value. And let me do suggest something radical, that you have half of your money in the S&P 500 and half of your money in small cap value. Now, that combination has historically produced about 2% more than the S&P 500. And here's the part that's fascinating, that if you look at all of the negative years since 1970 for the two-fund strategy and the S&P 500, and you added up all those years that they lost money because they did lose about 25% of the time, the S&P 500 lost more than the combination. And how can that be? Because these two equity asset classes don't go up and down together. And there are years small cap value does really well, and the S&P 500 actually loses money. So this is magic when you can put together two asset classes. Now, if you used four asset classes, and, and they're easy to identify, the S&P 500, large cap value for 25% each of those two, 25% in small cap blend, that means some value and some growth, and 25% in small cap value. Those four funds over the last 96 years, have made 1.8% better than the S&P 500. And here is, here is what is so absolutely marvelous, is we have a, what we call a quilt chart that you can see the returns one year at a time since 1928. I love numbers. And you can compare those four different asset classes one year at a time. What was number one? What was number four? Hmm. And you'll see this amazing difference from the top to the bottom. You, you have to ask yourself, is that the same stock market? How can one be up 22 and the other one's down seven? Well, that's the way the market actually works. And people need to understand that, 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 that volatility, that randomness. But the four fund strategy, never at the top, never at the bottom basically right hanging right there in the middle because it's the average of these four great long-term great equity asset classes. And so instead of having something that's bouncing all over the place, you could, in, in essence, you could select the one that is close to the middle. Now that means you never get to be number one and that means you never get to be number four or five, if you want to look at it in that way. And that's okay, because what we are looking for is a return that will meet our needs with as little volatility as possible. And the only thing I can't stamp on that comment is the word guaranteed. Absolutely. But you know, you and I are both committed to making sure people buy cheaper index funds that that, that, that leave more money in your pocket, that doesn't guarantee you're going to be number one. There's going to be some active money manager out there that's probably going to beat the index. In fact, over 20 years, about one in 10 managers is able to beat the index. The problem is you, you can't find them beforehand. You don't know who they're going to be. So I, I know that we're both on the right path. The question is, how do we reach people? You're reaching them. And how do we present the information that they they get it? Not from a, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not a salesperson, but I have no income generated out of the work that we do. And 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 the bottom line is, is that we're simply trying to get people the best that we know, but then you got to see the information to make that judgment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now there's somebody listening and they hear the variety of, funds you're talking about in this equity for fund portfolio. And yeah. they're thinking, well, what about just buying a total stock market index fund, Paul? Isn't that the same thing? Can you tell us why it's not or why it is? Well, I can tell you why it is. In fact, the, re the, the actual return, again, done by the academics of the total market index going back to 1928, 
is a little bit under the S&P 500. They're, they're virtually the same investment over the long term. And the reason they are is because they are cap weighted returns. And so the very big companies in both the total market index and the S&P 500 are driving most of that return that you see every year. So either one of those are fine. Uh, but and, and what, of course, the total market people will say is, well, yeah, but we have some small cap value and we have some small cap growth. What they don't tell you and they know is that historically small cap growth has been a lousy investment and has compounded at a little over eight versus about 13 for small cap value, okay? You put those together, which they've done, you have eliminated the advantage of small cap value. And so what happens is you end up getting a return that's virtually the same as the S&P 500. If they would just build that total market index so it didn't have any small cap growth, it would improve the return of that portfolio. But the reason that I like being able and what we do on our site is we tell you what ETFs, we have what we call best in class ETFs so people can decide, yes, I want to be this kind of an investor. Oh, and here are the mutual funds or ETFs that I should use so that you can really be a do-it-yourself investor. But the reality is that even when you talk about small cap value, there's a huge range in small cap value funds. A lot of people don't know it, but there are six major indexes that call themselves small cap value. <laughs> and the difference in return over the last 15 years, on average, is 2.5% a year. Well, that tells me somebody wow. needs to spend some time to figure out why did some end up towards the top and some ended up towards the bottom. Yeah. That's not true with the total market index or the S&P 500. They're all kind of the same except for what the expenses are. But it is true about these asset classes that the portfolios are put together in different ways. And that means they have different long-term rates of return. And our desire, and, and I'm what I'm recommending for people to do is the same that I that my wife and I did for our newborn granddaughter a, a couple of years ago. We put money away for her retirement and we divided the money between a S&P 500 like fund and a small cap value fund. And we picked the two, the best two that we could that's there to serve her for the next 90 to 100 years. I love that. I love that. Now, one thing that you and I have alluded to a lot in this conversation, but maybe people didn't catch on to, is the importance of controlling fees as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we keep saying index fund, index fund, but you know, a lot of people will get involved in looking into their 401k or maybe working with an advisor. Can you talk about the importance of understanding fees and the impact? Well, it's huge. It's huge because it's guaranteed. It's a risk that is guaranteed to happen to you. And if you compound high fees for the rest of your year, you're doing exactly what Einstein theoretically said, except backwards. You are reducing your return over the rest of your life. And so those that, that fee difference is huge. Now, remember that one of the reasons those fee fees are high in many cases is because the funds are actively managed. So let's just follow that bouncing ball. In an index fund, number one, you get more companies in the index than you do in an actively managed fund, less risk. You have lower fees in an index than an actively managed fund, guaranteed less risk. We get uh, a, a, a portfolio that is guaranteed, almost guaranteed, to match the return of the index you want to be in, whether it's large or small or value or growth. Whereas the active manager is out there doing their very best to pick the best stocks. And sometimes they aren't even obligated to be only in big. They could be big or small or value or growth. They're just looking for the best way to make you money. That is a wonderful desire. There is so little evidence that it ever happens that 
you realize, wait a minute, I can choose to be in the index and only one out of 10 active managers will do as well as I do. Why would I take the risk of picking a manager who underperforms? But it gets worse than that, Andy. When you say somebody underperforms, you might ask, by how much? And many of those people, because there are people who actually track actively managed funds, and they show, here's the return for the first quartile, and the second quartile, and the third quartile, and the fourth quartile. Well, what if it just so happens by randomness, because a lot of people believe those returns are, in fact, random, you end up in the bottom quartile. Instead of a 10% compound rate of return, you get a 7. And yet that manager was trying everything they knew. But it wasn't until 1976 when John Bogle came out with the index fund that people started to get it. They laughed at him. They, they mimicked him. I mean, they made fun of him. Called it Bogle's folly. Who would ever want to be in a fund that wasn't managed to make more money? Well, the fact is now we know. We know what's, what's happened. And indexes have become the major investment. And by the way, all most most 401ks are automatically going into target date funds and good ones are built with index funds. So you can own the target date fund and it holds index funds so that your, your expenses are kind of like as low as you can go. I love this. I love this conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your passion on this topic. I uh, love getting... Uh, financial education out there that that truly helps people Great. on their mission and just Thanks. makes it a little more simple because it can be, it really can be simple. And I know that's your mission. Let's talk to the person who's listening and they are in their target date fund right now in their 401k and they're hearing us, they're hearing this conversation. We talked about a lot of things. What's one small step that they could take to maybe improve their returns following this call? Well, if they're in a target date fund, uh, the first thing they could do is uh, invest more in the target date fund. That would be a good idea. In fact, uh, I encourage people to, to uh, not invest a dollar amount, but a percentage of your wages. And I encourage people to raise that a little bit every year if they can. But if they get a raise and they're investing based on a percentage of the, what they're making, they're automatically going to be putting at least the raise ad addition uh, into that account. So, you know, that you have control of. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to, to, to make a higher rate of return, you're going to have to add something that gives it a, a, a little a push to do that. And that, from everything we know, the easiest thing is just small cap value. We know small has paid a premium. We know value has paid a premium. When you buy, invest in small cap value, you're picking up two premiums. The premium for small only is about another 1% less. So, so adding the, the, the value to the small uh, gives you that extra bump. You could do that with 10% of your, of your investments. You could do it with 20% of, of your investments. I hope someday you'll have Chris Pedersen on here, Andy, because uh, he's you know he's the king of of that strategy and has built tables that just show you what you what what's the difference between ten and twenty and thirty and forty and fifty, and and uh, and, and that's what you can do. Now, what's important here is uh, I've got a table that shows S and P five hundred on one side and small cap value on the other, and 10 different combinations of those two. What happens as you add 10% and 20% and 30%? Not just to the return, but you got to look at the losses that were sustained in order to get that extra return. It's almost the same. It's a tiny bit more. I mean, so tiny that very few people would even know the difference of what the 90-10 did compared to the all S&P 500. But we're going for inches here. Every, remember I said, every half a percent you can squeeze out. You got yourself more money to spend in retirement, maybe an earlier retirement, more money to leave to others while you're alive and when you die. 
I mean, all of the benefits and you don't ever have to feel like, like, like you're greedy about this. You're just trying to be smart, get it on automatic. Don't, don't spend all of your time worrying about your money. You control what you control. I know you teach this, Andy. You know the things you can control. Make sure you control those. And then do smart things that I can't say you can control them, but you've done all the smart things to corral them and and, and keep them within some guardrails. You can do it and you can be a great do-it-yourself investor. By the way, if you don't have to pay somebody 1%, which is what I did for a living, if you can do be a do-it-yourself, just that itself, 1%, we're talking about a million dollars there before we even look at the investments. Yeah, 1% might not sound a lot, but these are million dollar improvements. And I know you're talking about a lot of this in your book. Tell us about We're Talking Millions and then where people can connect with you and learn more from you, Paul. Well, We're Talking Millions, it's free. The PDF is free and it's free because I want people to get it, read it, and then send it to everybody they know. I don't care if anybody goes to Amazon and ever buys that book. But it, it, it is 12 simple, really simple steps to supercharge your retirement. And each one of those 12 is a million dollar decision. And you could say, do you mean that if I did all 12, that I could make an extra 12 million? Yes, that is what I mean. Now, it does mean you're going to have to save money. I mean, you've got some responsibility here too, yes. <laughs> as an investor to build the foundation. I mean, this is this is one of the things a lot of young people don't understand. When you start investing, you're starting a business and you are a partner with the market. And if you look at the first year, how you did and how the market did, I don't care what the market did. You are the heavy lifter. You put in a thousand bucks and the market went up 10 maybe. Okay. And the market, you know, what did it matter? You helped start to build that foundation. Later in your life, it comes that your money you put in is very small compared to what the market's doing. And it becomes a powerful partner to have. But you are the senior partner in the beginning. And you cannot depend on the market to get you immediately where you, you want to go. But uh, we're talking millions. You can go to paulmerriman.com. And you can get that free. You can get two funds for life free. You can get uh, spending your way to wealth free. By the way, in the in the back part of spending your way to wealth, there's a very famous book uh, by Daniel Kahneman. Something fast and oh, it's terrible being eighty. Uh, oh, thinking <laughs> faster and slow. But it's a famous book about the psychological part, the hurdles we have in life. It's five hundred pages long very few people will ever finish that book. They'll get through the first half. It's fun. The last half is work. Paul, the author of, and one of our directors of, of, of spending your way to wealth has the 48 different uh, biases that Daniel Kahneman talks about in his book in 16 pages. So ah, it's worth and it's free. <laughs> so, so that's just paulmerriman.com. And boy, we have over 200 tables and charts and you know, all sorts of ways to make you a better do it yourself investor. If you are overwhelmed by what we provide, it, it may be that just a target date fund is the best thing for you and maybe a little bit of small cap value and go on with your life. Absolutely. And these are all stepping stones too, as you say, Paul. I mean, getting started and understanding what a target date fund is and then growing from there saying, oh, how that can work. And a great part about Paul's site is those visuals. I'm a visual person. So when I see those visuals, I'm like, ah, I get it now. So everybody go to paulmerriman.com, learn a lot more from these free financial education resources. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. All the best to you and your listeners and your viewers.